Welcome to Bible Insights with Wayne Conrad. God's Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Today's topic, suffering in the life of Christian or suffering Christians. This may just be one part of many that I speak on this subject, but my purpose today is to simply look at Peter's letter, his first letter written to the Christians in what we would call today Turkey, or then referred to as Asia Minor, who were suffering for their faith. He calls it going through various trials. And as he speaks about the sufferings of the Christian, he draws truth, inspiration from the sufferings of Christ. Though the sufferings of the Christians and the sufferings of the Christ are related, they are not exactly the same thing. My purpose today is to try to get you to read the epistle of Peter, 1 Peter, all of it from beginning to end. Sit down with the scripture or listen to it being read to you as you travel along and listen carefully to those passages that speak about the sufferings of the Christian and the sufferings of Christ. There are several sections in the letter which specifically addresses this topic. The first one is found in 1 Peter in chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Let me read this to you. I'm reading from the ESV. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Well, that passage will preach. But let me go on. In this you rejoice. What? You're rejoicing in this salvation. Okay. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Why are they being grieved? Well, they're grieved through the various trials that are common to human life. But specifically, Peter has in mind the various trials they're undergoing because of the faith they have in Jesus Christ and because they're holding forth a witness for Christ in the midst of a pagan society. This produces often trials for the Christian, sufferings for the Christian. So he's writing about that. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Why do these trials come? Verse 7, so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you've not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. He goes on. Now concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Now, what I want you to notice in this particular passage with reference to the trials or the sufferings that the Christians are undergoing is for a purpose. God says in this passage of Scripture, it is for the purpose of testing the genuineness of your faith. And when you, your faith is tested and it comes out as genuine, this would result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven. Now, this Jesus Christ is the one that we love. Though I've not seen Jesus Christ, I love him. If you're a Christian, if you believe in God through Jesus Christ our Lord, because of the cross of Christ and his glorious resurrection from the dead, you love Jesus. You have an affection in your heart for him. You want to serve him as Lord and Savior. 
because he means everything to you. He is the one that has brought you to the knowledge of God. He is the one by his own sacrifice and suffering has canceled out the debt of your sin and the punishment that is due you. And now you and I have the experience sometime of suffering various trials for his sake so that the genuineness of our faith might be manifested. We are, when these times of testing come, to continue steadfast in our faith and rejoice with the joy that the Holy Spirit gives us. It's inexpressible, filled with glory, because we are identified with Christ who suffered for us. The result of all this is we will obtain the outcome of our faith, which is the full salvation of our very beings at the return of Christ. We're already saved. We believe in Christ. We have been granted the gift of salvation, which is eternal life. But there's a fullness of that eternal life that is coming in the future when there will be a resurrection from the dead and when we live with Christ on the new earth that's been renovated by God himself as the glorious habitation of the redeemed. Now, how does all of this come about for us? It comes about through the sufferings of Christ. You see, Christ suffered in accordance with the will of God. In fact, in accordance with the eternal decree that God had made from all eternity. This is what revelation means when he says that he was the lamb foreordained before the foundation of the world for the sufferings of the cross. Now that's what Christ did. He came in the fullness of time in order to bring about the salvation of God's elect. He did so by purchasing them with his blood on the cross. It was intense suffering, physical, mental, spiritual, in every way. He underwent the punishment that is associated with our sin, that in bearing our guilt and enduring our punishment, he might bring us to God. Now, we have sometimes the privilege of undergoing various trials because of our faith. When this happens, we must turn to him with joy, and we must turn to him with a trusting obedience to his word. For he is a God worthy of our greatest obedience and of our most intense joy and devotion. That's just 1 Peter chapter 1, and just two paragraphs in the middle of it telling us about the trials that Christians can undergo because of their faith in Christ, how this connects with the sufferings of Christ and what we should do in response to the sufferings that we endure for his name's sake. Now, vertically in our relationship with God, this should result in a greater faith in him, in a deeper love for our Lord Jesus Christ, and horizontally, 1 Peter chapter 1 Verse 22 indicates that this should also result in a greater and sincere brotherly love. Here's what he says. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and the abiding word of God. And this is the word, this word is the good news that was preached to you. This is the good word that we preach today to those who would want to know God and to follow in the steps of our Lord Christ. This has been Wayne Conrad with Bible Insights.